Um, I'm Chad Furman. I'm a product manager on the Ansible side, but for the context for this conversation, probably more interesting to you is I was a customer for a very long time. I used Ansible. I installed Red Hat Linux for the first time in 1997, so I've been doing this a very, very long time. But um, yeah, I came from a oil and gas company, so I know entirely too much about how things work in an industrial setting. So I think this will be a fun conversation. Uh, for those who don't know, the microphone doesn't, or does it actually project no, it in here? No, okay, they told us it wasn't projecting in here, but it's for the online stream. That's why we're getting, uh, taking turns on the microphone, uh, even though you can't hear it. Okay, uh, my name is Adam Miller. I am uh, one of the software engineers in the Ansible organization, and uh, lately I have been Chad's partner in all things Edge, and specifically Industrial Edge more recently. Okay, agenda. We're going to talk about all the things and talk about challenges get into what we've actually been working on in the Ansible space. It's all very community driven, of course, because you know that's where we start from the open source side. And then get into really interesting things we've done with common industrial protocols and actual real world applications, because I think that's what really matters is how do people actually use this stuff. Uh, so edge computing is a huge, huge pain if anybody's ever thought about it. Like a lot of people have been in the data center for a very long time, but thinking about how do you scale and manage and have the interoperability and consistency of all of these different things and tie them together and how do you make a thousand devices work the same or how do you push an application to tens of thousands of devices and manage them and know what their IP addresses are and what they're supposed to do or what they think they're doing and the telemetry that all comes back from that. I know we had, there are some people here that I've worked with for many years on this and I don't think anybody's actually solved it yet but we're, we're getting there. So who here knows, I, I like to make this interactive, so um, who, what, what, what does industrial edge mean to you? What's that? Excellent. Anyone else? Yep, absolutely. Anyone else? Fun. All right, cool. Literally anything that makes things, so agriculture, factories, cars, electronics, Anything that could have robots or machinery and all of these things that are, if you've been in the IT, sp IT space for very long, we always think about VMs and containers, but when you work with an industrial com company, a container is something they ship things in. It is not something that they use for applications. So it's a different conversation. And I have that conversation often like, yeah, containers. They're like, yeah, we're on Windows and VMware and we don't know what a container is, sorry. So it's fun. So what we've been working on, Adam and myself, is working with different companies on how do you bring some of the best practices of IT into the OT space. So OT being operational technology, and that's what a lot of them refer to it as. So things like SCADA systems that control robots and SCADA systems that control roller coasters because, yes, they actually do the same things from the same companies which is really interesting because at first, whenever we started going down this, me coming from a manufacturing space, I was like, oh wait, yeah, you probably use the same motors to control a roller coaster that you use to control a robot in a car manufacturing plant. Kind of cool stuff, but they don't know anything about IT in this space. Like to them, IT is the guy that they call when their stuff breaks and it is a ticket and it is a waiting period. And now that they're starting to kind of talk to the IT people, and instead of them being the enemy, they're now becoming friends and starting to think about things like, oh, so automation isn't just about factory plant automation. Automation is actually about IT things too, because if you say automation in the OT space to them, it is process control automation, not IT automation. I think I kind of talked about this a bit. So here are all the different things that you see a lot in this space. Anything from devices and servers to sensors that are detecting things in the air. That was one of, the, one of the big ones where I came from. They're always looking at particulates that went in the air because there are laws about what you put in the air when you're an oil and gas company, sometimes. But it actually gets all the way to like substations from electric. And of course there are central servers that are there that generally are ran by IT, but sometimes they're actually run by the OT people. And to them, it's just the servers. Like it's not something they really know much about. It's just something they have to have to run all of the other things that they need. So unfortunately this, we couldn't bring this with us because it would have been really expensive. But at Summit, we had some really, really cool booths with different companies we had been working with. 
So we actually had uh, the Schneider Electric semen, or, uh, water. So this is how they do wastewater management in a lot of places. We had it where you could change the valve knobs, where you would change the water displacement in the tanks, and then you could actually rip out a server and it would continue to work. And then you could plug the server back in and it would reprogram the server and continue to work. So it was kind of cool to actually show real world interactions in this space because a lot of times we're like, hey, here's a computer and we put a VM and a container on it and it runs an app. But it's actually cool to see stuff actually doing things. Am I doing this whole deck? Oh, yeah. Just tell me where to jump in. I don't care. You can take this one. All right. Can I have the clicker? Yes. My turn to talk. All right. Um, <clears throat> so one of the things that we've been uh, doing is uh, market research and talking to different uh, customers and potential customers and just finding out where their problem spaces are. And we've identified a handful of business challenges. So uh, this being kind of a summary of uh, the business challenges that we're seeing out there uh, from a plant manager uh, kind of dealing in this actual space. This is their day to day. Uh, so the ITOT convergence is still happening, and this is kind of a, a almost like a culture shift that we're seeing in in a lot of the industrial manufacturing, industrial edge, uh, transit, uh, logistics, these kinds of markets where it's an adaptation of technology that has existed in the IT space for a while that we have to modify and evolve and develop new capabilities for to be able to address the OT space. Uh, largely because the uh, devices there are different, the protocols are different, um, the types of networks they talk on aren't IP based. There's a lot of legacy technology there that we have to interface with. Um, you find different challenges for things like data gathering um, when your networking is either intermittent, uh, bad, high latency, or uh, low throughput. You find yourself having to design or architect the way that you deal with what you would traditionally do in a data center um, to adapt to these environments. So the Purdue model, uh, which if anybody in manufacturing at all would be very intimately aware of this, effectively this is what all of the industrial, I don't know if this is like a requirement thing or just everybody does this, but uh, the industrial manufacturing follows this model and this is a, a security model for networking in every zone may only talk to the zones it borders. Uh, nothing can traverse from, like so plant, uh, plant level near edge to operation level, nothing can actually go more than one, one hop. And this becomes problematic. And you can only go from the bottom up. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah sorry. <laughs> and you can only go from the bottom up, so you can't reach back. Um, so this becomes problematic because you have to deal with your ingress versus egress, and you have to figure out how to traverse these things to accomplish automation in a way that you might not have been able to otherwise, or, or in a way that you would have been able to otherwise. It just kind of depends. So this is, this is a space that from an, I guess, a traditional IT perspective is very, very different, or the, the variables in play are different, more limiting. So we have, we've had to find different methods to accomplish this. I could rant about the Purdue model for like two hours if anybody wants to rant. <laughs> yeah. So uh, this is kind of a marketing slide because Edge, <clears throat> Edge is hot right now as a topic. Uh, Gartner loves to talk about it. Forrester loves to talk about it. This is new, like it makes its way around. The, it's not new though. This is, we've had retail stores uh, for as long as any of us have been alive. Um, those of them that have compute resources there, they were doing Edge computing. Um, this is just kind of something that has, has become, I guess, more relevant in our space specifically from a technology perspective, from a software perspective, from an open source perspective, because we are bridging the IT to the OT, and IT is typically where open source software and our, you know, the things that we develop are able to be addressing those problem spaces. Now we're extending it into uh, other problem spaces. And um, so, <clears throat> uh, yeah, you do this. <laughs> yeah, you do this. <laughs> so 
Who all here uses Ansible or knows what Ansible is? Hands? Okay, some people don't know what Ansible is. And I asked that question so I could tell you what it is if you don't know what it is. So Ansible, actually, no, I'll give you that slide because that's the next one. Okay. So we built, we built a platform around automation and what we've had to do with this, so actually, I'll let you do your slide and then I'll go back to that slide. Yeah, we did it backwards. Bad, li bad alignment on, on slides. <laughs> All right. Um, <clears throat> Ansible is an automation tool. Uh, it is also an automation language. The idea of it is for it to be simple, composable, human readable, and if at all possible, idempotent. Idempotency allows you to only make state change when state change is required, such that you can repeat and rerun that automation over and over and over again and only inflict change upon any system or systems uh, when required. The idea from the perspective of what we're building and what we have built in the open as an open source project is for it to be the automation language or the lingua franca of automation. The goal is for it to be universal. You should be able to learn this skill and then take it into network automation, security operations automation, industrial OT automation, IT automation, etc. We are doing everything we can to adapt the technology underneath and design it in such a way that it is pluggable, uh, composable, and reusable such that this automation uh, skill set and tools and technology uh, is adaptable and can be, be used throughout. Well, I haven't gotten there. So one of the things that we did here uh, in, in light of bringing the automation technology of Ansible into the industrial edge is we implemented uh, a connection plugin for Ansible to be able to talk to programmable logic controllers over the common industrial protocol. So these devices are not connected to an IP network. They are not devices you can traditionally reach out and get to. However, they are connected to a backplane. That backplane does interface with a device that has an, has an IP address and does speak IP. Um, so we wrote software that has the ability to reach out to that controller, that controller then translates it to the backplane, and then we can traverse those um, SIP networks uh, and, and automate programmable logic controllers. And for those who are not familiar, a programmable logic controller, or a PLC, is the thing that controls the robot arms, or controls conveyor belts, or controls different elements of the actual factory floor, the thing that produces widgets and boxes and vehicle parts and the bits inside of our laptops and our cell phones. Um, so that, that can be interfaced using the same language that you can use to automate your Linux system uh, via the Ansible automation language. So now I'll let Chad rant uh, po poetically about the automation platform. So I'll add the PLC thing there. So where I came from, the way a PLC was managed before and think about how many motors it takes to manage a conveyor belt. The only way to go and program them was someone walked around a manufacturing site with a serial cable and plugged them into each device and ver verified that they were configured correctly. Now you can just use Ansible to do that, which is kind of fantastic. So really short, sweet, we've created a platform around Ansible. So Ansible is a command line language. There's also a platform where we've built it and made a lot of the things. So. As much as I love doing things on the command line, if I'm gonna to have to do it against 10,000 devices, I don't wanna do that on the command line. It, uh, it just is not a good way to do things. So we've created a platform to do all the things that you hate doing, like credential management, integrations, all of the self-service things, and you just go push the rocket to go run against those 10,000 devices. Oh, most important part about this, though, is the execution plane at the bottom. So remember that Purdue model? use the execution plate with a, with a network mesh to be able to get into those different parts of the environment. So now you don't have to worry about 5,000 firewall rules get to every device, one firewall rule, one execution node, and then that can go against all the things in that particular network segment. Aha, oh. give me, give me, give me, pictures. Uh, okay, so the one thing that I, I wanna touch on that uh, Chad just said was about uh, the automation mesh. So Automation Mesh has either a bi-directional or unidirectional communication method. 
So if you needed to function in an environment in an industrial space that does follow the Purdue model, you can set up to where certain zones only allow ingress traffic. So by doing that, that will put your automation mesh node in that space into effectively a pull versus a push. So everything from the automation platform still looks as though it's a pull, but everything will do store and forward intelligently based on uh, the routing algorithm on down. Um, and the, it's, it's just Dijkstra's, like, we don't have to be fancy about it. It's, you know, this is a tried and true algorithm. Uh, um, it does what it does, and this allows us to deal with that space. So um, as Chad alluded to before, all configuration used to be done manually with these PLCs. Uh, we had to uh, just kind of trust that it was fine because there was no validation. We couldn't really do CI on it. It was just a thing. Um, so over here on the, let's see, right-hand side is a, uh, it's a Pelican case. And inside this Pelican case is a uh, Rockwell, Allen Bradley Rockwell PLC, a control node, um, an emergency stop button, a... Uh, drive that actually will spin that little puck with the Alan Bradwell logo on it. And then that little blue thing down here, uh, that is actually a, a, an LED. So it could be any kind of a status light. And we set up a, again, we couldn't travel with this because we just unfortunately couldn't. Uh, but <clears throat> the automation to accomplish that was all written uh, with Ansible as a play, Ansible playbook. Uh, so for those who don't know Ansible, the automation recipe, if you will, is called a playbook. Um, all of this is automated from scratch. The second you plug it in, everything is completely programmed and uh, it will send that drive spinning. It will stop the drive. It'll spin up the, it'll light up the thing, the uh, LED and turn it off. Um, and that was something that we did using this open source Ansible collection that we wrote called community.cip, CIP standing for Common Industrial Protocol. And we have the ability to uh, read and write tags. So in a PLC language, it's effectively how you set or unset uh, particular Boolean flags to inflict change upon a, a running system uh, in a programmable logic controller. And then we can do audit and validation of information. So this allows us to do our audit trail and do testing. Um, so this is effectively what an Ansible playbook will look like to control, command and control those things. And this is, uh, it's just YAML. <clears throat> For those who don't know Ansible, it's just YAML. So everything that you have set up, you have a host, and un after the host keyword is your host pattern. So this will, the pattern will be the set of devices that you talk to, and there's a thing called an inventory. The inventory devices are individ individually itemized, either statically or dynamically by that pattern. Um, we wanna define whether or not we're going to uh, privilege, privilege escalation, so become is to become a more uh, privileged user. As part of the privilege escalation, we have a set of tasks. Each of them has a name. I have an indention error. Please ignore that. Uh, um, <laughs> uh, we're going to call the namespaced uh, module of ensure tags. And this is going to be the thing that takes care of the task operation. So we have a name of the tag and a value. And again, that is an item potent operation. It will only make change when required. Uh, we want to gather fact data. We want to inspect the current state of the running system so that we can then validate it later if we would like. Uh, and then also we're going to verify our firmware version. And I just, okay, yeah, tag value for the sine wave. That was what that one was. So that is a sine wave generator, which was part of a demo that we had that would actually start to articulate a sine wave on a, on a, a human machine interface. Um, okay. And that's kind of the goal, is for it to be human readable, easily composable. And this down here, uh, this is a templated variable. This is part of some of the uh, string interpolation magic of the Ansible automation language that uh, there's plenty of wonderful documentation out there if anybody wants to check that out. Um, okay, so beyond that, we also have for doing device edge. So if you have compute nodes at these 
environments or in these cabinets that are co-hosted with your programmable logic controllers. Um, Red Hat has a operating system that is based on a technology called RPM OS tree. It is immutable. It is composable. It is easily distributable. It is a Delta application of an update and it is atomic in operation. And we uh, created some collections to be able to automate the lifecycle management of that entity. Uh, so OS build is how you actually build your operating systems. They are bespoke. They are uh, artisanally crafted by you and your team. You uh, will effectively pass in the blueprint or the desired outcome of your image. And then from there, we can do a full deployment, lifecycle management. We can, uh, I'm sorry, I keep saying lifecycle management like that means anything. We'll set up an RPM OS tree repository. We will actually automate the distributed update of systems. So to Chad's comment before about tens of thousands of hosts, we can do this at scale of tens of thousands of hosts. We can do the full rollout. We can do the update system. And because of the nature of OS tree, uh, we can do it in these uh, fractured environments with bad network, with low, uh, low fault toleration, things like that. Because um, I, like, I like to pose this question. For those who run RPM-based distros um, or, or any traditional package manager, DPKG, uh, I don't know, package build, pick one. If you're updating your kernel and it's in the process of rebuilding your initRD and you kick the power out from underneath the server, will it boot? It's Schrodinger's server. We don't know. We don't know until we try. Whereas with this type of a system, that cannot happen because it's either all or nothing. And if there is a failed attempt at a boot, it will roll back to a previously known good state. Uh, and this, this automation that we've created allows you to do that. And then the next phase of that is microshift. So for those who are familiar with Kubernetes, who want to do Kubernetes at the edge, uh, there is a minuscule version of OpenShift, which is a Kubernetes distribution called microshift. Uh, and then we have, the again, the ability to run application payloads out on those devices, um, build the images based on our PMO tree based technology for those, do a full lifecycle management of that as well. A um, lot, of, lot of stuff in one slide, I apologize. No, no, yes, no. what? So you can do Fedora and CentOS and RHEL with... Oh, oh yeah, yeah, with these, we can do Fedora, CentOS, and RHEL with these. So we can do a CentOS stream um, 9, 8, 8, 8, 8 and 9, uh, any current non-end-of-life Fedora, and Red Enterprise Linux 8 and 9. Yes. And we full CI test all three of those for across each of their uh, releases. So if something breaks, please let us know. We'll add a regression test and make sure we don't break it again. Uh, yeah. Chad. Oh, no, wait. Ha, ha. Um, I already talked through this without diagrams up. I'm very sorry. <laughs> Very quickly, um, this is basically the flow diagram of what these, oh, we have 10 minutes. This is the last slide. We can do this, I believe in us. <laughs> uh, this is the flow diagram of what the automation content that we created does, and it allows you to have your image builder host, your rel for edge um, image gets built there. Uh, from there, we have our device blueprint, which will define the curated content that you would like to put into it. That will generate it. We will extract the contents to then serve up for your update system. And then we can roll that out to your device edge images. And we also have a boot ISO that can be downloaded and you can flash devices with it, that kind of thing. And we actually also have a tool set to be able to do credential injection post uh, creation of the ISO. Um, so that way you can, depending on what your chain of trust or your processes are, those kinds of things. Uh, and then for the open, the, the micro shift one, uh, the only thing that you add there is you have day two operations of doing the application deployment and lifecycle management. That's uh, the micro shift one. I added it. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Ooh, he added fancy words. You did actually. Start. Did I? <laughs> I haven't slept. I arrived in this beautiful town at half past midnight last night. Um, so bear with me. I lost my train of thought. 
It's all good. Chad, it's your turn. No, we're done. <laughs> no that's, that's a sales slide. We don't want that. Questions? Because I'd much rather listen to you guys talk than me and Adam talk. We talked a lot. <laughs> is he is he being serious? No, God no. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> Chad, Adam, Adam, Chad. Adam Williamson is a uh, fantastic human and a great A heckler. Yeah, well, no, I'm, I, I, I'm waiting for Peter. He hasn't heckled yet at all. No, no, nothing. Okay. That's good. <laughs> no beer for you. Hey. <laughs> Yes. Yes. Please, please build me an image in fifth mode. Oh. Uh, please put it. He needs fifth mode. Pl please put an issue in for that, <laughs> and then I'll send it to Peter. <laughs> um, yeah. So the. the Excellent. Okay. Peter's working on this. It sounds like. Yeah. Yeah. At the end of the day, we just use the OS build bits behind the scenes. Yeah, so the thing that we build is the automation, and the thing that we try to ensure is that it's easily consumable and repeatable. If you need core operating system technology added, uh, we will glad to refer you to our uh, friend and colleague, uh, Peter, in the back there. <laughs> Toshio? Yeah, so We, we have a bi-weekly, believe me, we, we talk. <laughs> okay, I'll repeat them. Yes, sure. Yeah. Toshio? Do we have a place to plug in the CI of the image that is built? That's a, that's a, that's a him question. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so literally the, the, the build that comes out, um, you... The way that we do it is we just provide you an example playbook of how to do it, and you just put your inputs. Um, at any point in that phased process, you can just pause, extract the artifact, and then send it to a, a pipeline. And you can actually do that in your Ansible playbook, so you can have the CI uh, validation occur, and then allow the playbook to continue and perform your... CD for you if you want, or you can then pipe that over to another system for that. Uh, if you want to use Argo or something else or whatever is hot this weekend. Um, all of our CI is in the GitHub, right? Yeah, I mean, all of our CI is in the GitHub. I don't know if it's particularly like the best way to do CI. We're, uh, the way that we built CI is integrated into the open platform that the Ansible open source project uses. So it's all like all the data is there. Everything is open and available. Uh, the only thing that's not is our cloud keys because we don't want people mining Bitcoin on our <laughs> uh, on our AWS bill. But um, yeah, it's all out there. We could definitely absolutely plug into any system there. And, and that's kind of the goal is to offer an opinionated method of doing it, but be flexible when needed. All right. Any more questions? Any more questions for the images? Do you use images to start files? If you have one image, you start files, right? Repeat the question. So the question is, is do we have one kickstart file per image and are we generating the kickstart file or can you add one after? Uh, so, okay, so if you want to change a config, do you need to rerun the whole pipeline if the config can be addressed in a kickstart? Uh, you can do either. We, we will support either. So... The options are there in the automation to add kickstart changes or post build, you can just supply your own in the boot line like you otherwise would. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
So uh, the way we do that is with versions. So versions are either provided or auto imp incremented, and you have to you have to actually tell our automation that you want it to auto increment and create you a build every time you run. Otherwise, it will come back and say that that version has been built and is already cataloged and indexed. And my laptop's going to sleep. <laughs> no. <laughs> You know what? It's fine. It's fine. Yes. Role-based access control is your friend. So this was that conversation I had around doing things on the CLI for 10,000 devices is not very good. So within the platform, there's definitely role-based access control and you would have assigned different roles to different groups. And coming from a company that was really 12 different companies, that is a very tedious job, but it's very important that you think about who has the access to what roles and the separation of duties of who can do what. So definitely you would need the platform and do that within the platform. Architecting identity is a whole different thing that nobody ever thinks about until they're like, oh wait, we shouldn't let Steve do all the same things that Adam does. <laughs> uh, we, there's also a, a centralized logging and audit within the automation platform. So the automation platform is composed of basically 14 or 15 different open source technologies integrated together, and one of the things that are in there is the the SSO, the role-based access control, policy management, that kind of stuff. Yeah. So we just still have one MSP employee destroy the directory, but we will find Yes. If you granted one employee enough access in the role-based access control to destroy the factory, yes, you could find them. <laughs> <laughs> it may be too late, but yes. <laughs> So the question was, how do we ensure that, that, or basically, do you have like a dev test type of an environment for this? Yes, you should absolutely have development environments. The question is, is how much is it going to cost to have a development robot environment in manufacturing? And I can tell you because I've set them up, it's really expensive, but it's worth it if you can automate an entire factory floor that becomes hundreds of factory floors. So there is a cost to benefit there, but yeah, you don't, you don't want to test this. Do not test this in prod. <laughs> I mean, I test my code, but I only test it in prod, <laughs> except at a factory. <laughs> All right, I think we, we have, have one, one minute if there's any other questions. Out of time. Out of time. Oh, wait. Last. So we actually just announced an AI platform to do that. So we're, we're working, it's in the upstream in a beta right now, but it's called Ansible Lightspeed. The question was, is there a way to write helpers? Uh, there's also a thing called Ansible Dev Tools that I highly recommend you check out. Uh, it's integrated into VS Code and the language, we're out of time, we're out of time. The language server can also be used from other editors like Emacs and Vim if you're, uh, we gotta go. Ricky, they Also, our friends over at Steampunk wrote some cool stuff, too. Check it out. Awesome. Thank you.